you know, this this was out in the eighteen eighties uh, with with uh, William Banting, yeah. uh, and then we spoke about this with epilepsy in the early twentieth century, and then we spoke about this in the seventies and eighties with Atkins, and now we're speaking about it again. This will not go away, yeah, because this works. Welcome to the Flippin' Health Podcast, where we turn medicine on its head, flip it upside down, shake it all about, and see what comes out. We're going to challenge convention and change medicine for the better. Hello, I'm Grant Schofield. And I'm George Henderson. Welcome to the Flippin' Health Podcast. Grant Scofield here with Rob. Rob, tell us about yourself. Who are you? What do you do? Yeah, good day, Grant. Hi. Uh, yeah, Rob Zabo. I'm a GP in Melbourne. Um, yeah, so I've, I started the clinic with the Low Carb Clinic uh, about nearly four years ago now. We see lots of patients who are looking to reverse insulin resistance with a variety of diseases, whether it's weight, type 2 diabetes, even managing type 1 diabetes, and to see a lot of patients helping them to adopt a low carbohydrate diet to help their health. So, so most people would be surprised that there's those clinics are popping up and then they've, mm. they've been did, you, did it surprise you that you did one well um i certainly didn't see it coming you know a couple of years prior to that it's just that um i sort of through my own health journey ended up in this in this area where with my um diagnosis of type 2 diabetes some seven years ago now um it, you know it sort of led me after about a year down the journey of starting a low-carb diet myself and just saw the power that that um had in reversing the disease and um giving me this health and vitality that I didn't think was going to be possible um, and kind of couldn't ignore that, you know, once I'd experienced it myself and then um, started to cautiously implement it with some patients and they had the same, similar sorts of results. Um, and, you know, as um, you know, many, many people have said, once you see these things, you can't unsee them. And so, um, you know, I just began to realise just how powerful this stuff is. So, you know, after I'd kind of, you know, gone through a lot of my own practice patients, um, spoken to them about this and um, you know I sort of thought I need to scale this in some way because uh, I feel like I've had the reach that I can have in my own practice yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's that was how the low carb clinic so how, do you, how do you operate you're not bulk billing with Medicare and that no it's a, it's a private clinic um, but uh, so we work with a dietitian so I've got um, Camilla Dahl is a dietitian that I work with and, and she's just awesome um, what we do is see patients initially together yeah. and uh, for the first half an hour of the consultation it's basically me running the consultation uh, finding out what their goals are uh, and all their past history with Camilla there as well yeah. and Camilla contributes a bit during that consultation oh, as well that's cool. that's cool so you know she is privileged to all of the nuance that goes with them telling their own story and you know the journey as to how they got to be here and what they want to achieve so that then then she takes them next door to her room for the second part of the consultation and continues on with the food aspect so it's really nice because the person dealing with the food is the person most qualified dealing with the food not yeah. i.e. not me yeah uh, and but the guy and who's dealing with the meds and all the other right. comorbidities and things correct. going on as you correct yeah. yeah yeah so it's really nice that way it's really having having camilla there for that whole medical consultation uh, I think helps her to, yeah. to see the context that means the patient doesn't have to repeat themselves. Yeah. Uh, so it actually yeah works quite well. And, and how does it work with you getting referrals from other GPs and what's been the oh. response from the community? Yeah, look, it's been um, interesting. There's been a, such a variety of ways in which people come to see us, whether it's them looking this up themselves online and finding us online and coming off their own bat, or some um, specialists are referring to us. You know, we've got a, a rheumatologist, Daniel Lewis, who refers quite a few patients with fibromyalgia. He's a kind of yeah. Melbourne's fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome guru. Yeah, right. Um, and we've had amazing results with um, people with fibro um, having the pain reversed and chronic fatigue having their energy return cool. um, by doing a ketogenic diet, it's often quite quickly. Yeah. So then there's orthopedic surgeons... Um, and uh, oh, so they will send them in a sort of prehabilitation situation. Is that how they do it? Depending, it? Either, either trying to prevent surgery. So yeah. we've actually got some really visionary surgeons that are trying to talk themselves out of, or you know, what, practice their way out of, out of surgery, which is you know pretty uh, kudos to them. Yeah. Uh, uh, or, or even even preoperatively for people just to lose weight to maximise the chances of having a successful surgery. Okay, cool. And the system's changing a bit around diet, weight, the prevention of disease and healthy lifestyles. And how does that... How are you seeing that in Melbourne and Australia? And the system... People still talk about us having a sickness system, not a health system. Mm. Have, have we made progress? And, and, we, and, and what, what do we still need to do? Look, uh, uh, there, there, there is, and, and it comes through 
as I talked about, the power of of, um, of this way of eating and of, of doing, you know, combining combining it. Um, diet's not the only thing that we need to look at when it comes to health. There's pillars of health mm-hmm. and the sleep and and managing um, enjoyment, finding thing, finding aspects of life that are fully that are fulfilling and enjoyable. I think yeah. is also critical to well being. And so, um, I think when people can combine those things, and actually low carb is amazing because it gives people this mental clarity mm. which then, then facilitates those other aspects of life I think and you can plan because you have this mental energy and mental yep. clarity so um, I think when, when people see their friends and families experiencing yep. this change yep. that's what is probably driving it's not the top it's the bottom up yeah but do you have any bitterness up against the system in the sense that you know you've had to set up a private clinic you're relying on out-of-pocket expenses and in fact you feel like hey, look, presumably you feel like you're doing one of the more important jobs in medicine <laughs> I, I, I must admit, I, it has crossed my mind that I feel a bit cheated in my education. Yeah, I, I, yeah I, we, you know, a lot of the things that I've I've learnt are the most powerful. I've kind of had to have to stumble across. Yeah, it shouldn't be that way. Yeah, we, this is the stuff that should be in our lectures as medical students, because this is the stuff that is the critical, you know, life and death stuff. That that, that things like. Um, you know, if you want to reverse your type two diabetes, if it's quite severe, you need to do a lot of fasting. You know, yeah. you, you need to probably have really infrequent meals, and, and if you have low carb, um, three meals a day with snacks, it's not going to reverse. Right, because you need to deplete liver glycogen and, and, yeah. and get a basic reset. Is that an easy way? The, to the longer you fast for, the, the deeper into repair, the more accelerated that repair yeah. becomes. You know, and so eating um, twice a day for somebody who's got severe diabetes yeah. probably isn't enough fasting. You know, I've, I've had one man that just keeps on popping into my head is a guy that, that ate... He came to me, so I don't think I'm an ogre. But he um, <laughs> said, for the last three months, I've been eating once every 48 hours yeah. for three months. Yeah. Um, and he'd gone from three pills um, for diabetes down to non-diabetic off medication in, yeah. th- in three months. Yeah. And it just kind of shows to show, showed me... I mean, this is the stuff that I'm saying. You know, I should have been taught. Yeah. But um, it, he, sh- he showed me, he yeah. taught me that... When you fast, that the fast gets more and more rapid in the repair as yeah, the longer you're right, going. Right, right. And if you can get a big chunk of repair, because as soon as you eat, repair stops. Yeah, because you get you get anabolic again. Right. Yeah. You you know, um, yeah. it's kind of like the bricks arriving. You know, at the front of the house means you need to keep on building the extension, right? Because yeah. there's going to be more bricks arriving. You need to get rid of them. <laughs> yeah, Whereas right. when they don't arrive, then that gives you kind of a chance to do a spring clean. You can start doing some repairs around the house. Yeah. You know, but as soon as the next lot of bricks arrive, the repair stops. Yeah. And you, you need to go back again. into building. Yeah. Right. Uh, great analogy, great analogy. So just on that, I think, I don't know if you just went to a talk uh, I was facilitating with with a bunch of docs and one of them remarked that basically she got her nutrition information by going to a, um, a talk that someone gave at her daughter's school. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was her source of a change again yeah, more medically but, about But there are more people talking about this, you know, in, in, in non-academic circles yeah, and, yeah. and that's where this is happening. But it, because, you know, this, this was out in the 18... Uh, 80s with with uh, William Banting, yeah. uh, and then we spoke about this with epilepsy in the early 20th century, and then we spoke about this in the 70s and 80s with Atkins, and now we're speaking about it again. This will not go away, yeah, because this works, yeah, right. and this will stay. This will keep on coming back, and I think I feel as though this is now going to, this has now established itself as a part of our culture. So, so thinking about yourself and then beyond into medicine, what is what, what's the best possible future look like in 10 years? What what is what what are we going to be doing? in medicine what it would have changed well we've now um, you know in April of this year we saw the uh, American Diabetic Association start to acknowledge that low carbohydrate diets actually have quite a a, um, a, uh, a, a profound effect profound effect on, on improving diabetes and on type 2 diabetes and reducing medication requirement and, and are safe mm-hmm. and that's radical uh, and I think that um, and, and they also commented that there's quite a bit of evidence yeah. it's interesting that it, it took this point to them for them to say that because that evidence was there last year too yeah, and the year before <laughs> and the year before and the year before you know and there was no mention of there being any evidence and suddenly there's a there's mention of being, that there being quite solid evidence we knew that there was the yeah. solid evidence it's just that it hasn't actually but you know um, good on them for, for now saying that so this can't be ignored forever and I, I think that there's going to be more and more the fact that there are more and more um, people that are talking about this to their to their doctors and to their diabetic educators is meaning yeah. that there will be more discussion, which is going to mean more officialdom um, having um, comment on it. Yeah. At what point will we change the health budget to invest more heavily in, in this type of thing? Of you know of of the of the eighty odd to hundred billion dollars that gets spent in Australia on on health, what's it going to take to reallocate some of that? 
Uh, the, the driving force there is people wanting to feel well. Yeah. You've got to remember that obviously the, the counter force is profit. Yeah. So, and people also don't want to be sick when they are sick. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, and so if they, can, if they can notice their friends and their family starting to actually feel well and start to engage with life and feel good, that, that, that is a real driving force. That, you know, this is, this is where um, politics originates from. You know, I think that politics has its origins in, in people wanting to better their own society. Yeah. It, politics' orig- origin isn't in profit driving for corporations. This is a new radical development in where... Yeah, good, good point. That is that is the point of of public office, really, is, right, is to change right. society for the better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sure that you know, early on, back in you know ancient Greece, there was um, people that were, could see them themselves profiteering from you know decisions in politics. But yeah. for this 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 magnification of this uh, profiteering from politics and and and, dis, and uh, policy is a pretty exaggerated version of that. And so that is a that is really sort of a modern era uh, situation and. That that the, the basis is people's well-being. Um, so, I think as we get sicker and sicker, you know, often it takes. Like for me, it took it took me being sick with my diagnosis of type two diabetes to to get here. Is it, is it embarrassing when you're? Do you, do you feel like ashamed about that when it's happening? You're, you're trained in medicine. You've been to medical school. You're you're in general practice. Well, I was, and you and you're presumably not just walking around hoovering down Coca Colas and eating. Uh, 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 liquor all sorts. Hey, I had a lot of sugar in my life. Yeah, a hell of a lot of sugar. I was raised on sugar. You know, my mum's sort of quite, you know, uh, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, you know, I, I had no idea. And in fact, I remember someone telling patients that sugar was fine as, lo- as long as you weren't diabetic. Oh, you've said that. Oh, absolutely. That's what I was taught. <laughs> I remember. Oh I remember being taught that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's. Um, I was ashamed. Yes, yeah. when I was diagnosed. Mm. And I kept it to myself mm. because it was like a, you know, like in inverted commas, you know, fat man, diabetes, you know, and, and, and I was about 10 or 15 kilos, kilos heavier than I am now, so yeah, I wasn't right. obese at all. No. But I um, still felt like I'd done something wrong, mm. you know, and, you know, it's obviously that's how it's uh, taught to us that, it, that, that there's a mistake that you've made in your lifestyle in some way. So mm. I didn't know what that mistake was. At that time, I didn't actually recognise that the sugar in my life had been the cause. Yeah. But now, obviously, in, re- in reflection, I can recognise that. Yeah. Uh, so you're also an environmentalist, uh, which I think people will find interesting, and you're a mm. um, well-educated environmentalist. I've heard you talk um, passionately about that. Mm. Uh, and there's a lot of discussion about our food supply mm. And, mm. And, and what the solutions are. We can, we've, we've got environmental problems in, in, on the planet. Uh, what's, what, what goes there? Well, for me, it's all one and the same because uh, whether it's you know looking after you know the insides of your organisms or looking after the the planetary organism, I think it's all pretty much connected. I don't see there being a difference, and so you know, I, I think that you know we're, we just describe ourselves as being discrete you know entities like you're a man, I'm a man, yeah. but we are you know our skin's impervable, um, permeable, permeable, <laughs> and, and so um, we are actually part of one, and and the globe is you know I think you know this kind of creature, so. Uh, for me, they're they're very similar, and the the big issue, obviously, of of our time is this climate situation. That this is the thing that we hear about a lot, and mm. and where the um, where that's coming from. And the big kind of gripe that I have is that the role of animals in carbon sequestration, particularly the role of ruminants mm. uh, of, of cows of sheep in um, resulting in soil build up and soil growth, i.e. carbon sequestration, is not being spoken about nearly enough. This there's, is how there's, a lot, the, there's a lot of anti-beef and meat and farming. Yeah, yeah, farming. yeah. And this is bizarre because before um, anthropogenic climate change, so before the Industrial Revolution, we had more ruminants, far, far more ruminants than we have today, all making their own methane. Yeah. And we didn't have um, a climate emergency. Yeah. And we need to ask the question why, uh, despite all that methane, we didn't have a climate emergency. You know, and, and I guess the conclusion that I can only come to is it's not the methane. Yeah. Um, and what those animals were doing is fascinating because now when you, when you take animals off, um, like for example, if you take uh, 
in, in, in the US and around the world in, in, in Africa, various places, animals have been taken off um, national parks yeah. because they've been assumed to be trampling the earth and destroying the earth and causing deserts. What actually oh, happens actually is... You get, you get the exact opposite effect. You, you, actual, you actual accelerate desertification. the desertification. Yeah. And um, the interesting thing and is why that... why is that? Yeah, so what happens is the... Grasses in those areas, you have long periods of, 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 of an arid period. So you have dry, dry periods of the year. Only maybe three months of the year might, yep. there might be moisture. Yep. And um, unlike other areas where there's moisture all year round. So, for example, in England, there's moisture all year round. Mm -hmm. So in England, or, or New Zealand, frankly. In New Zealand, there's yep. moisture all year round. So grass doesn't actually dry out. Yep. And what happens is that it, it composts um, in a moist environment and it, and it rots naturally. Yeah. But in most of the world, that doesn't happen because in most of the world, you have prolonged dry periods. And if the, if the grass doesn't actually compost, in, um, if it dries out, what, what happens is that it oxidises and it becomes this hard, tough sort of grey and then black, long grass. Um, that blocks sunlight. And because um, it either compresses or it stays um, uh, standing upright, it blocks the sun and it doesn't allow new grass to grow. And it doesn't and actually it, compress. It takes it's, not, it's not taking any carbon in either. It's not dealing. With well, it. when the grass doesn't grow, then you're not actually pulling carbon out of yeah, the out yeah, of the. Yeah. You got to remember that, that that grass blades of grass are photovoltaic cells. Yeah. You know, and they actually not just produce energy and they produce sugar yeah. um, out of sunlight and carbon dioxide. Yeah. So they're actually taking carbon dioxide out of the out of this. So the way that you actually need to get those blades of grass that are at the at the um, soil level to to grow is to provide them with sunlight and you need to actually get rid of that 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 dead grass oh, so you, you're saying so, um, uh, animals will come through and hurting animals will come through and trample it down enter top. ruminants yeah right ruminants work um in a uh pack, a pack predator uh herd effect and what happens is they they eat out quite a bit of that grass that would have otherwise been left there to oxidize and block the sunlight they eat that grass out they dump manure dump urine and then they move on because they don't want to be eating over their own manure yeah. So they actually move on quite quickly. This is in nature I'm talking about. Yeah. This is what was happening before the Industrial Revolution because we had, you know, So vast, like bison on the North African Right, right or, or buffalo, yeah. uh, antelope in yeah. Africa, um, yeah. you know, the springbok, you yeah. name it, right? Um, and they would be very in a very tight pack because of the predators that were surrounding them and to, just to keep them themselves safe. Um, and they would always be in a tight pack but always moving. And that patch of grass where they'd, you know, eaten the grass out and, and dumped all their manure and manure and urine wouldn't go they wouldn't go back to for you know many months maybe three six twelve months and in that time that grass just goes berserk it goes green and, and the whole thing far from damaging the the the, the, the grasslands what these creek what these beasts are doing is fertilizing the grasslands enriching They're, the soil right you know and then you're providing them the sunlight and the moisture for the grass just to go berserk yeah so they're actually fertilising the... And this is how the grass plains, which have got massive amounts of carbon because of really deep soils... Um, and you remember the, you got to remember, the deeper the soil, the more carbon sequestration you've got. In Australia, we um, have gone from, on average, prior to European settlement, about 10% carbon content in our soils. Yeah. So uh, um, down to about 1%. Wow, is that right? On average. Yeah. So we've... As, you know, we have this concept of what Australia looks like, and when we drive around, you know, the countryside have been kind of you know bald green patches. Yeah. It didn't look like that. It yeah. was lush. Yeah, right. There were creeks flowing everywhere because the soil held the moisture. Yeah. The soil was deep. It held the moisture. It slowly released the moisture into little creek beds, so that the creeks were permanent all year round yeah. um, phenomena. And um, it, it was an, a place of abundance. And we know this from the diaries of the early settlers in the 1830s. Yeah. They described nothing like we see today. Right. And in the meantime, it's become desert. So we've lost 90% of our soil carbon. We've gone from about 10% to about 1% um, carbon content in yeah. our soils. Yeah. So that carbon's in the air. Yeah, right. So the thing is that the carbon that we, we're talking about in terms of this... Um, uh, climate change is not just fossil fuel burning yeah. and in actual fact there's been some some people have made calculations and um that and i don't know how accurate but that quite possibly if we were to stop all fossil fuel burning today we probably we possibly wouldn't stop a, a climate emergency because of the fact that we're accelerating in our erosion of soil right and plant monocropping isn't going to sort that right and so all, all these people who are so well intentioned with their vegan diet 
to you know thinking that they're going to be saving the planet and, and, and that they're moving away from meat um, because that's environmentally sound um, for all the right reasons are accelerating climate change through leading from uh, leading to um, the uh, erosion of soil which of course when you erode soil you think well that just you know is bad because we can't plant plants no that soil's now that that carbon's now in the atmosphere yeah and you can't get it back very easily it's, it's difficult the, the best way you can get it back is by utilizing ruminants yeah so they're part of the solution, not part of the problem. Right, yeah. right. And this is the bizarre irony. We're talking about we're, we're demonising something which is actually the solution. Now, I'm not saying that the way that we're actually um, farming beef at the moment is the best. It, it's not because and, it doesn't And especially nature. in some parts of the world with feedlots and concrete. and Oh, awful, yeah. awful stuff. And, and so the amount of water and the amount of um, grain and uh, uh, soil erosion that you, that you get from planting corn and soy to feed cattle is awful, the, yeah. let alone the, the cruelty of, of you know, treating yeah. animals that way. Yeah. Um, and them living in their own manure, yeah. which is awful yeah. in itself. Yeah. But um, you can actually stock more and more um, cattle on land that you regenerate. Yeah. The thing is, we're all talking about sustainability, and sustainability is not enough. We can't sustain um, an absolutely destroyed ecosystem. That's not enough. No, we need to, we renew need to regenerate. Yeah. We need to renew our ecosystems, and this is what cattle can do for us. Yeah. But the thing is, and there's some really, really cool stuff that's developed in the last 40 years in terms of regenerative agriculture techniques that work. Like this yeah. stuff's proven. I kind of feel like this is the keto of of of, 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 plan- of planetary health. Yeah, right. But it's uh, it's an important thing to be literal with right how do you mean well just I mean because I, I get this all the time and I'm not literal like you are with this gotcha. with yeah. this side of things so people are going what about the meat and the animals and the planet and I'm just like oh yeah yeah yeah. It, well, it, and, and I was the same about yeah. a year ago and so I, I, the thing is I just can't stop myself reading now I find it so fascinating yeah, it's, it's fascinating. It's kind of where I was you know about you know, you know five six years ago with reading about locale because yeah. I just couldn't stop at that stage too yeah. but it, it is the, the most fascinating part of it is the parallels that I find with low carb and keto yeah. because you know what I was talking about with, with fasting and how yeah. you, the, the body regenerates. Yeah. You know, you reverse type 2 diet. Yeah. Your body it's wants to... It's the exact to... opposite of what you'd think of, right? At first, Correct. When you first Correct. think of it, it's like, oh, I'm not eating anything, I'm just going to be starving. Correct. Yeah. But actually what's happening is repair. Yeah. And this is the interesting thing, is that your body is doing that, and it's doing that because it wants to move in that direction. Yeah. Our bodies actually move towards a state of health. Yeah. They don't move towards a state of disease. Yeah. Given the right environment, given the right circumstances... Like, I don't go into my patient's pancreas and make it secrete more insulin. I don't yeah. do that. No. It does it itself. Yeah. Well, and, it, the, and the planet is the same thing. Correct. As saying. It's, it's an correct. ecosystem that, that's, that's trying to be it normal. It moves towards a path of regenerative yeah. um, health. And yeah. all you need to do is provide the right environment, yeah. i.e. Um, provide fertilisation for, uh, for the grass to grow, sunlight access to, to soil level yeah. and time. And it will move in that direction. We don't need to go planting grass. It yeah. will do it. And we don't need to invent a carbon sequestration technology. We've got it. Yeah. The planet devised it um, millions of years ago. Billions, probably. Right. Yeah. yeah. yeah so, right. so this is old. Um, just the same as low carb and keto is something that's been around for, you know, over 100, 150 years. Well, right? it's probably been around for, uh, for, since humans have been since on Since the, the planet, beginning right? of the yeah. planet. But, yeah. you know, we've, we've been talking about it for a long time. So, yeah. yeah, you know, it's basically about bringing back... Um, Restorative health, whether it's on a planetary basis or, or an individual, you know, indiv- person basis, it's it's exciting stuff. Awesome, Rob. Thank you so no much. <laughs> You're welcome. And that's it. Thanks for listening to the Flippin' Health podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Precure. Prevention is cure. If you enjoyed this podcast, please like and subscribe. If you know someone who could benefit, please share it with them. Together, we can change medicine for the better. Change medicine for good. Good.